Life is filled with problems. Sometimes these problems come on us like a storm, like a storm that you weren't even expecting. Others are slow, like it starts like a fire and then it builds and builds and builds and it seems to last forever. Today, we're going to learn from King David as he is hit with a, a long involved problem that is kind of like a fire that keeps building and he comes to realize that he has to pray because God is the only one that can help him in a situation where David has no control over. Join us today for Psalm 31. All right, good morning. Welcome to our Psalm series. Glad you are joining us. Today we are going to be working through Psalm 31. And Psalm 31 is a lot of like David's other Psalms. But what we're going to learn from David today is this, that our greatest prayers spring from our greatest time of need. And I think we all know that because life is filled with times of need. Sometimes we have problems and they're just like sudden bursts, like they just come upon us. We wake up one morning and something happens that we absolutely weren't expecting. But other storms are like long, drawn out, like it starts small. It's kind of like what's behind me here with a fire. It starts small and it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. It just never seems to go away. Uh, when we used to live out in Surprise, um, we didn't seem to be in an area where there was lots and lots of rain, but every so often, I would say maybe five times when we lived out there in, in over you know 30 years, we had what were called microbursts. And it was like this storm sat over the top of our house and just dumped as much rain onto our house at one time. And it, it was just like shocking. It was just like this sudden burst of rain. And sometimes it would flood parts of our house. One time it literally filled up our pool and flooded our whole entire back patio. But it came on suddenly and it did a lot of damage. But it, it left us with this like mess to clean up. And life is like that. Sometimes you just wake up, you have a really important meeting, but you, you wake up with the flu and you're like, what? I can't do that today, but you, you have to stay home. It's just suddenly, it just came upon you. Uh, sometimes it's like a broken bone. When Dusty was younger, he like went snowboarding and have, planning on having a great day. And then he broke his collarbone and ended up in the hospital. Maybe it's like a loss of your job that you weren't expecting. Maybe it was a horrible argument you had with your spouse or your, your child or your parent. And the thing with sudden bursts like that is that you know it will eventually be okay, but it hits you out of nowhere, all right? That, those storms we get, because it's just life. But there are storms in life that are like firestorms, like, like, like I said, what's behind me here? It starts out with just a, a strike of a match, and then it builds and it builds into a firestorm. And, and, and fires take a long time to go out. The firestorm in your life could be that 10-year court battle. It could be the 20-year battle with depression. It could be waiting three years to find a job. Maybe it's the back injury that's left you with chronic pain and you try really, really hard to trust God each day, but it feels like your life is never gonna get better. But here is what we need to know, and we see it over and over in Psalms, and, and we see it especially in the life of David, that trials are a part of life. They just are. We live in a fallen world where there's sin and there's sickness and there's evil, and, and that's just the way that this life is. But as followers of Jesus, like David, we have to learn, we have to learn to look at our trials completely differently than other people do. We have to look at them like this, as a way to grow closer to God, a way to trust Him more, to depend on Him, to rely on Him, to cling to Him. Because through it all, through the microbursts of life and the forest fires of life, that's what we're going to have to deal with. We want to trust God during both of those times, the small little microbursts and the long involved forest fires of life because trials are a part of life. We know that. 
And I think David understood this. He had no idea what tomorrow would bring him. He had no idea if he would ever live past the nighttime because because he's he deals has dealt with a lot in Psalms. Um, for him, he was mostly on the run for his life. Like King Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him year after year after year. It's like this this picture behind me. It just started with just a little jealousy with King Saul. And then it moved to something worse. And then it moved to a spear being thrown at him. And then, then armies after him. And so it just built and it built and it built. And, and David had to learn what you and I need to do, whether it's the, the, the short burst or the long firestorm, is that we need to learn this to take one day at a time. We just do. Because Jesus tells us to do that. He says this in Matthew 6, 34. He said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow brings its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let's just focus on today, making it through these 24 hours. Jesus' brother James said this in James, um, I don't know, what, what 114 maybe it is? I don't know exactly what it is. I didn't write that down, so there's that. Somewhere in James chapter 1, 2, 3, verse 14, he said, How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. It's like, I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. David's son Solomon says this in Proverbs 27.1, Don't brag about tomorrow, since you don't even know what the day will bring. So knowing that going into this psalm, this is why I like this psalm so much, because most of the psalms are just about trials in our life. And yet it reminds us what to do with the trials in our life. And we've been learning this, to focus on God, focus on God's purpose for the trial, and focus on how God can use us during or after the trial. And in today's psalm, we're going to see that David is in trouble again, because that's the life of David. <laughs> the setting of this psalm, we don't really know exactly the event, um, but we do know that he was in very, very deep distress, and we know that he needed God to rescue him. Some think that it was this particular point in his life. We'll, we'll read it in 1 Samuel 23. Um, verse 1 says this, One day news came to David that the Philistines were in Kelia stealing grain from the threshing floor. David asked the Lord, Should I go and attack them? Yes, go and save Kelia, the Lord said. But David's men said, We're afraid even here in Judah. We certainly don't want to go to Kelia to fight the whole Philistine army. So David asked the Lord again, and again the Lord replied, Go down to Kelia, for I will help you conquer the Philistines. So David and his men went to Kelia. They slaughtered the Philistines and took all their livestock and rescued the people of Kelia. Soon, Saul soon learned that David was in Kelia. Good, he exclaimed. We've got him now. God has handed him over to me, for he has trapped himself in a walled town. So Saul mobilized his entire army to march to Kelia and besiege David and his men. Anywhere David went, Saul was right on his heels. Saul wanted to kill him, but David always had a choice. He could have said, you know what, God, I'm just tired of this. I'm tired of this firestorm behind me. I'm just tired of it all. I'm just frustrated with you, God. I'm mad. When is this going to end? Like, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of the pain, the uncertainty, the anxiety. And David could have walked away from God. And we have that exact same choice in our life when the micro bursts hit us or the fire, fire storms come our way. And yet we don't see David ever walking away. But instead, we see him do what he always does, which is this, cry out to God and cling to God. That is what David does. And I love the words that David uses in this Psalm. He, he calls God his, his refuge, his rock, his strong fortress. So before we actually get into Psalm 31, I want to tell you something really cool about this particular Psalm, because so many men who, who um, great men of the Bible who actually knew their scriptures, they quoted from Psalm 31, the, the Psalm we're going to be talking about. 
um, the author of Psalm 71, when we get there, which could have possibly been David, he quotes the first three verses of Psalm 31 that we're working on today. Jonah seems to quote Psalm 31, 6 in, in his book, in Jonah 2, 8. Jeremiah quoted Psalm 31, 13 six times in Jeremiah. But this particular psalm most significantly was quoted by Jesus on the cross as his final words before yielding his life in Luke 23, 46. Look for that. Luke 23, 46 says this, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Stephen, also the first martyr in the church, also alluded to this uh, particular psalm. Uh, in Acts 7.59. So as we start picking it up, look for those words that Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because this is what this, is what this Psalm David, you know, the people wrote and they remembered this Psalm that David wrote. So we'll pick it up in Psalm 31 for the director of music, a Psalm of David. Verse 1, In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide. David loved to use these words, rock and refuge, because most of the time he was running for his life. And he would always take refuge in the high rocks of the Judean wilderness. And it's interesting because in verse 2, God, um, verse 2, he asks God to be his rock, but he also says God is his rock. And, and it's like David is saying, God, you're my stronghold. You are my rock and my refuge. So please, like, be my rock and refuge because I really need you right now because I'm really in a lot of trouble. Verse 4 says this, free me from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. That's, that's, that just sounds like what Jesus said on the cross. But see, we know when, when Jesus says this, into your hands I commit my spirit, it meant, you know, David could possibly have died. And so, so when David said this, he's committing his life to God, saying, look, God, here's the deal. My life is surrendered to you. Do whatever you want to do with me. My life is in your hands. And it's exactly the same for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus. It means, God, whatever plan you have for my life, life, death, whatever, I'm okay with it. I'm just trusting you with my life. And when we get to that point, there's so much more peace in life. We don't worry about the things that that most people worry about. Verse 6 says this, I hate those who cling to worthless idols. I trust in the Lord. David knew that that people put their trust in in idols which were really nothing. They were just these little man-made things. But, But for David, God was so real to him. He was like, God, you are not an idol. You're not just this, this piece of wood that, like, you're, you're real, you're vibrant, you're in my life. And David knew that God could be trusted. Idols can't be trusted because they aren't anything. But God could. Uh, look at uh, Psalm 115, verse 3. Uh, he's, it says, um, our, our God is in heaven, and he does as he wishes. Their idols are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear and mouths but cannot breathe. They have hands but cannot feel and feet but cannot walk and throats but cannot make a sound. And those who make idols are just like them as are all who trust in them. See, for us, we don't really have lots of little statues that we bow down to and pray to or or, or, or trust, you know, or depend upon. But we have different kinds of idols. Our idols could be our own self-sufficiency. I can do this on my own. That can actually be an idol. Our idol could be our money. It could be our job. Anything that we put our trust in. And David says, idols are worthless to trust in. But he would put his trust in the living God who was right there with him all the time. And that begins with remembering. Remembering how God always came through for David. And we have to do the same thing. We have to remember God and what he has done in our life. 
Verse 7 says this, I will be glad and rejoice in your love. For you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to the enemy, but have set my feet in a spacious place. David knew that without God, he would be a dead man. He knew that God could hand him over to his enemy anytime he wanted. And he saw that God was the one that was protecting him throughout his entire life. The lesson we learned from David is the importance of knowing God personally. Like really, because God was his refuge and his rock and his safe place. He's the same for us. I mean, really think about that. The Holy Spirit, God himself lives in our life. He's right there with us in, in everything that happens during the day. And we need to know him really well. And the way we get to know him is reading our Bible stories, reading the Psalms just like this. Because I think when we can get to this point, it changes everything just like David. My life is yours. God, my life is yours. You can keep me alive or you can take my life. You can change my circumstances or you, you don't have to. You're in control of every aspect of my life. And when we can do that, no matter what microburst comes in your life or no matter what long and drawn out firestorm comes in your life, I think that's when you find true peace. Because you just know, God, I know you're in this. I don't like where I am in my life right now. I don't like my pain, my heartache. I don't like any of those things. But God, I'm trusting you that you have a purpose for it all. There's something that's peaceful when you really honestly can get that. Because here's what we know about the earth that we live on. It's not really our forever home. And we can either live, you know, in these microbursts and forest fires, you know, sad and frustrated and angry with anxiety. Or we can just say, God, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust you. And if you take me home, even better yet, it's a win-win for me. Because if I go home and, and, and you take me home, God, then there's no pain. There's no sorrow any longer in my life. But living on this planet Earth is difficult. And I get that, especially if you are in, like we have here, a firestorm. When you're in your eighth year of chronic pain or your 10th year of depression or, or that family feud that's gone on for 20 years and, and it just won't end. Yet, we need to get what David is saying here. He says this in verse 9, be merciful to me. And that's sometimes for those of you that are in the firestorms of life, need to wake up in the morning and say that, God, I need your mercy today. I need you to be merciful to me, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. See, David understands what you're going through. He says, my life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Because all of my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors. I'm a dread to my friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten by them as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. For I hear the slander of many. There is terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take, take my life. David is saying, and it's exactly how a lot of you feel, and you can say the exact same thing to God. God, my life kind of sucks right now. That's how it feels. I have no strength. I am in distress. I am weak with sorrow. And some of you feel David's pain. That's exactly how you feel. You're discouraged and you're frustrated. And this is why we have to always read our Bible to remind us what David says after he's this miserable. He says in verse 14, but I trust in you, O Lord. And I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. I love verse 15. Imagine if we could actually really take that to heart and know that that's the truth. God, my times are in your hand. My days are in your hand. You know, every one of them. Imagine if we live like that, we wouldn't be afraid of anything. Because if our times, if our days, when we live or when we die, when that's all in God's hand, then there's nothing to be afraid of ever. I love what Job says in Job 14.5. He says, man's days are determined. 
He's saying, you have decreed the numbers of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. God's like, I have a number of days for you. Nothing you do is going to add to them or subtract from them. So relax, enjoy life, serve me, love me, do those things. I love Psalm 139, 15 says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David wrote Psalm 139. He's like, God, all my days are in your hand. And David prays this heartfelt prayer because people are after him. But he's saying, God, I don't want them to win. Please don't let them win. Verse 17 says this, Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I have cried out to you. But let the wicked be put to shame and lie silent in the grave. Let their lying lips be silenced, for with pride and contempt they speak arrogantly against the righteous. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. How great is God for those who take refuge in him. Isn't that amazing? I love how he says that. He's like, God, don't let me lose this battle because your name is on the line here. Look at verse 20. In the shelter of your presence, in the shelter, like think about that. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from the intrigues of men. In your dwelling, you keep them safe from accusing tongues. In other words, he's saying, God, when I come underneath your shelter, nobody can, nobody can get to me. Nobody can bother me. He goes on, verse 21, Praise be to the Lord, for he has showed his wonderful love to me when I was in a besieged city. In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. I, I thought, what a moment. In one moment, he was terrified that God had left him. I cannot imagine going through this life and thinking that I am cut off from the sight of God. Like that's, that to me is so terrifying. And yet he says, yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. I love how God always says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You don't have to repay someone for what they've done to you. God will be more than happy to do that. Verse 24, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. My hope today is that whatever comes along in your life, whether it's a microburst or a firestorm, my prayer is that you can be strong, you can take heart, and you can hope in the Lord daily and make Him be your rock and your refuge. And no matter what you're going through, uh, my, my prayer is that, that if it's a long firestorm, that you just take one day at a time. And one, God, let's make it through today. All right? Help me to be the best follower of Jesus today in this situation. And I think when we do that, we'll make it through life and come out on the other end, like Job says, like gold. I hope that helps today. Have a really good day.